And I am now joined by former Cowboy great Daryl Johnston. Daryl, we appreciate you joining us. And it's so hot. It's been so hot for weeks here in North Texas. I can only imagine for you, if you, if you ever have any thoughts back to Austin and training camp <laughs> this time of the year. Uh, yeah, my, my wife told me how how warm it had gotten uh, in the Dallas area. We, we were in Birmingham and then up in Cleveland and Canton for for the USFL. And I, I can't remember 100 degree temperatures in June. You know, we, we get used to that in July and August. But uh, I got back into town and was yeah, it's it's one of the first things every year is and I, I still say Wichita Falls. Um, you know, it, I still can't figure out how we can go two and a half hours north and it gets hotter than it is three and a half hours south. So someone's going to have to explain that one to me one of these days. Well, there's a reason they, they call it the hotter than hell bike race <laughs> exactly. each summer in, in, in Wichita Falls. Uh, all right, we're, so we're a week away from the Cowboys reporting for a uh, camp. Uh, getting back to how hot it is, you know, those Jimmy Johnson training camps, even as a reporter on the sideline, I was physically drained at the end of those two a days. Uh, they, they, these kids today, they have no idea what you went through back in the day. <laughs> no, not at all. And, uh, and, and even, you know, the OTAs, the quarterback schools, you know, whatever the moniker was that we, we were able to navigate some of the rules so we could hold them. Um, you know, those, those were very competitive, uh, even before we went to training camp. But it was always considered the unnecessary evil that you had to go through to earn the right to have the season. And, you know, for me, I mean, they were so physically demanding that I really didn't feel – as good as I did going into camp until about week four, week five. And, and that was my big complaint was, you know, we spend our entire off season, you know, getting our bodies into the best shape they possibly can be. So the day you walk into training camp is the best shape you're going to be in all season. The day you walk out of training camp is going to be the worst shape you're going to be in all season. And it was just very counterintuitive for me. So uh, I, I always struggled with the old system. All right, when you look at this Cowboys team, what, what do you think is the best thing they've got going for them as they go into this season? Oh, there's a number of different things that I that I think that they can grow and, and take a step from last year. Um, you know, I think the big thing is, is the chemistry that they'll develop with Dak and, you know, just being around, you know, Mike McCarthy and that offense, you know, a, a little bit more and, and getting more and more comfortable. Um, you know, what are they going to do defensively in year two with Dan Quinn? Um, you know, th there's some really, really good things uh, to be excited about. Um, so I think we always have that feeling at this time of year. And now it's just a process of going through and seeing, OK, where are the areas that we really need to, to kind of shore up a little bit? I, I think the big concern has to be offensive line. Uh, when you look at this team, it's always been an, an organization that's always had a really, really strong offensive line. Things have been built off that that group. And they're in a little bit of a transition right now uh, with, with some guys that have retired recently, some guys that are a little bit older right now. So how quickly does that starting five come together? Because it, it's never a situation where you have one standout guy or, or two really good guys. Uh, it's, it's how does that five function together as a group? And that's when it becomes really special because I've seen a number of offensive lines in the NFL that don't have any pro bowlers on them. But the five of those guys work so well together that there is that, you know, that, that old saying, you know, it, it, the, the sum is better than the, than the, the individual parts. So um, that, that'll be my big thing is how quickly can this offensive line come together and grow and start to play at a high level. Can you believe it's uh, or it's now the 30th anniversary of that 1992 team, which uh, is talked about by many being the best Cowboys team ever, maybe one of the top five to 10 NFL teams ever 30 years since 1992 now. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy how quickly time has gone by. Um, so uh, it just, I think we all wonder, we go back and just, we were down um, in Atlanta when, when Nate went into the Black College Football Hall of Fame and it, you know, it was, it was Tony, or it was uh, uh, Troy Eggman, me, Dion, Nate, uh, Mark Stemnowski, you know, Tony Wise was there. Um, and just kind of going back and, and thinking about those days, um, you know, was was really it was really unique. And, and, and even getting, you know, the ability to get Dion's perspective from, you know, somebody who was an opponent at that time, uh, you know, in 92 uh, was was really interesting. So um, as young as we were, if free agency doesn't come around and, and that group is able to stay together, it, I, I think we all wonder exactly, you know, what what that group would have accomplished over the years. And if the coach would have stayed, too, how about that? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was rather important. Uh, that 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 one piece or that Jimmy Johnson guy was was pretty was pretty key. Uh, you got a chance to see Jimmy uh, uh, earlier this month uh, as as the USFL, as you of course being the uh, executive vice president of football operations of the USFL, and uh, Jimmy played a part in your championship week in Canton, Ohio, didn't he? He did. He did. Um, I wanted it to be kind of a celebration. So, you know, our, our group planned, you know, that that trip to Canton not only is something for, you know, our players to go and compete for a championship, but also, you know, we all wanted to reward not just the players, but the coaches themselves for all the hard work that they had put in during the course of the regular season. So uh, I was really surprised how many hadn't been to Canton. Uh, and there was a number of coaches, you know, on the four staffs that were there that that was their first time there. Um, so the opportunity to have them go up and do a walkthrough, uh, to get ready for the game, but then to be able to transition and go into the museum and do the tour and then kind of come together as a, as a family there, uh, with all four teams, all four staffs, you know, have lunch and then have Jimmy come in and, and do a, a presentation. And, and then the Q and a at the end of it, the very last question, uh, was just unbelievable. And, and if, you know, you had to script everything you wanted Jimmy to hit on during the course of that presentation, you know, he nailed every one of them, but that last question, his response to one of our players and how he answered it was absolutely perfect. Can you reveal what that last question was? Yeah, it, it was, it was one of our guys, you know, asking Jimmy as a guy who, you know, put together a championship team at the collegiate level, put together a championship team at the professional level. If you're looking at, at us as players in the USFL, you know, what is, what is it that you're looking for? And his, his answer was awesome um, because it's not just about what you do on the field. So he said, listen, you're going you're gonna to come across my desk as an evaluator because of how you play the game. But that's just a part of it. He goes, I'm going to go into my network and I'm going to reach out to any and all the coaches I know or can get connected with that you've played for. I'm going to reach out to all the guys who you've been teammates with that I have a connection to. And I'm going to ask them who you are as a man. How, how hard do you work? Uh, how accountable are you? And Jimmy had already gone through that, that one thing that he always does is, you know, I've got a guy here that does everything right. And I've got a guy here that doesn't quite, you know, do everything that we want him to do. And, and do you really think I'm going to treat those guys exactly the same? No, I'm always going to treat this guy. So he had already gone through all that. And then just for him to get into the little things. And, and that was one of the big things that we were trying to stress to our players all along. You know, you, you're not in the NFL right now. You've had an opportunity to be there. Well, why is that? And a lot of times it doesn't have a whole lot to do with the football part because they're good enough to get that look, but why aren't you staying there? So it's always something that's a little bit deeper. So it was perfect that Jimmy hit on, you know, some of the character, you know, components, um, you know, your work ethic, uh, how good of a teammate are you? How good are you at your assignments? Uh, just all the little things that, that make you like a true professional day to day. It, it's like the old story. If one player falls asleep in a team meeting, he gets cut the next day. If Emmett or Michael fall asleep, uh, he he'll go find story. a pillow for him. Yeah, he uh, he shared that story. He, there was a couple of good short stories that he can that he can share. And I had I had guys come up, you know, because they're at the age where a lot of that's that's new to them when they hear that. And he's oh, he was just he was just saying that, right? That's just like a scare tactic. I'm like, no, no, I was actually I was actually in that meeting room when that happens. <laughs> what has been your motivation uh, getting involved in uh, the spring leagues, uh, going back to the Alliance of, Amer of American Football and then the XFL? With the Dallas Renegades here, and now at the league uh, capacity, at the league uh, uh, capacity as the senior or executive vice president of football operations for the USFL, what what motivates you to do this? The the broadcasting has been awesome. Um, you know, it keeps you close to the game, um, but you you lose that competitive component um, because there's really no measuring sticks, true measuring sticks. Um, you know, at the end of a broadcast, you know how well did you do? It's it's very subjective. Um, you know, some people like my style because there's an affiliation to the Cowboys. Sometimes that's a that's a roadblock for a lot of fans. If you're doing a game against some of our, our NFC East rivals, you know, sometimes they're they're not excited to have a former Cowboy because they don't know if you're going to be biased, you know, in your perspective. So you, you got to kind of work through some of that. And, and a lot of times people hear what they want to hear. It, it's, it's not necessarily what you say. It's what they hear. Um, so you, you get into some pretty interesting conversations about that. But there's just not that that satisfactory component from a player's perspective of 
when you win that, that really great feeling of all the hard work you've put into it, you know, that sick feeling when you lose and okay, where do we, where do we need to get better? And you can get that evaluation. So it's, it's really hard, you know, as a commentator, you know, to kind of, you know, really have that, that opportunity to satisfy that quest for, for competition. Um, you get a little bit of that when you're the general manager of the team. So in San Antonio and in Dallas, you know, you're able to kind of fill some of that because, that's the team that you and your personnel staff have put together. And, and now you're competing against the other teams around the league. And, and there's going to be areas where you want to improve and, and elevate, you know, the, the quality of play at certain positions so that you get a little bit of that competitive nature back. Um, I found this year at the league level, it's, it's, it's a little bit broader. It, it's what's the success of the entire league. Um, so that's why, you know, at, at, at the end of everything, um, you know, after, after our championship game, on July 3rd, and you just kind of reflect back on everything that had transpired over the previous 15 weeks, you know, to see what was going on on that field at that time, and to think back as to where we were on March 23rd on our first day of training camp. It, it was just, it was an incredible journey, and you really could all of a sudden start to think back on all the little victories that you had, and it was one of the things that that I, I tried to stress to everybody that we were working with, you know, every day we're going to have little victories. Make sure we celebrate those, you know, because it's going to be hard. You know, we're going to, we're going to go through this and there's, there's going to be some tough losses. There's going to be things that, that we struggle with. So when we do have those little victories, make sure we're, we're celebrating those and we're, we're complimenting people that have done a great job and helped us have that little victory. So, uh, you know, along the course of that journey, you know, we, were, we, we made sure we took some time out to celebrate our wins. And we've seen uh, some of the USFL players uh, start signing with some NFL teams. In fact, the Cowboys signed the linebacker Christian Sam out of Allen High School uh, here this month. Uh, you know, I think when you look at the really with the pandemic and with the expanded rosters, not only in football, but you see it in baseball, basketball. There are players, athletes that are not getting the opportunity that they really need in, in the National Football League just because there's no room at the end. I think that there is a real need for a spring league like the USFL. I agree. I agree. And I think we've proven that it, it, at every turn with, with all the different leagues. And, and, and again, this year with the USFL, um, you know, and this was the largest draft class in the history of the NFL draft with players that had a draftable grade on them. But the, the number of spots available isn't changing. You mentioned that there was some increased roster numbers, you know, during the course of the pandemic, but those are all full right now. So the transition or, you know, that, that, that attrition that you have from year to year, that stayed the same, but the, the incoming talent was, was substantially larger. You know, you, you heard the number of draftable guys on people's boards around the NFL was almost double than it was in years past. And that, that kind of stays in line with the numbers that were being thrown around. So where do those guys go? Um, we were able to pull a bunch of them into our league. We expanded our rosters about two weeks after the draft. And, and we added, uh, you know, a number of players, you know, to each team, you know, we went, we went 10 guys for each team. Um, so that's, that's an additional 80 guys that we brought into the league. And a lot of those were the 2022s. Um, you know, we had seen them, they had wanted to go through that draft process, which I completely understand. You've waited your entire life for that opportunity. You know, I, I know you're going to, you're going to want to stay with the NFL, but, you know, in the future, we have to have that conversation. If that traditional path doesn't work out for you, there's another way to do this now. You can be non-traditional. As soon as that draft is over, you don't have to just wait on our call for a rookie minicamp. You can come right to us and, you know, we can get you in. We can get you five, six weeks of film, maybe change the perception of you as a player with some of these franchises around the NFL and get you an invitation into an actual training camp. So, uh, that was one of the things that we saw this year. We had some of our young guys that came on and played really well for us down the stretch. All right. I got to ask you about the big free agent signing of this off season in the NFL. And of course that would be Troy Aikman signing with ESPN. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Shockwaves, shockwaves <laughs> through the industry. Um, I, I I'm biased. Um, you know, he's a good friend. He's a great teammate. Um, and he is the best at, at what he does. Um, you know, people are going to like, it's like we talked about before, you know, it's a subjective business. There's, there's a lot of people that really like what Tony Romo does and his ability to anticipate Troy can do those things. Troy's just more traditional in his style and, and he and Joe work together more traditional, uh, in a broadcast booth, you know, Tony and Jim Nance, are a little bit revolutionary in, in how they're doing things. And I give Jim Nance a ton of credit for the way he's adjusted as a guy who's been 
traditional for all these years and has embraced Tony's style. Uh, and there's there's people that like that. And, uh, you know, I, I tell people all the time, Troy can do the same thing. Uh, it, it's not hard when Rob Gronkowski is, is, is a one by three formation and the three wide receivers go to the field and you put a small corner on Rob Gronkowski who's spread out. <laughs> there's a lot of us that know that that football is probably going that way. Um, so, you know, that anticipatory thing is, is something that Tony's brought. It's something that's unique. Uh, Troy could do that same thing, but I, I, I see him as being more of a traditionalist, you know, kind of out of that mold of John Madden. Uh, I, I just think he's outstanding at, at his knowledge of the game. And, and that's why, you know, the quarterbacks are, are usually the guys that, that are commanding that number one spot because they see everything, you know, we're all positionally kind of pigeonholed into our areas that we, that we work in on a, on a day-to-day -day basis, a week-to-week -week basis, a game-to-game -game basis. Um, you know, the quarterback has to see everything where I'm, I'm really, you know, focused, you know, from tight end to tight end, you know, vertically down the middle of the field, you know, that that's where the attention for me will always went to in my film prep. Um, you know, that's what the first year that Troy and I worked together. That's how we kind of defined our, our areas was, all right, I'll get everything inside. You get everything outside. And then you teach me about the outside. I'll teach you about the inside. Um, so it, it was fun to learn from them, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I just, I think it's well-deserved, um, it's, it's going to be strange not having them at seminar this year when we go out at the end of July, uh, for Fox and, and, and to be at a Fox seminar and not have Joe Buck and, and Troy Aikman there, uh, it's, it's going to be very, very strange. So he's probably as surprised as anyone that here 20 years after his playing career, he can make more money in the broadcast booth than he did during his NFL career. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just one of those strange things right now that's happening in this industry. And, and, you know, again, it's, it's really Tony Romo that, that kind of set that trend. He was the first one that kind of came out and commanded that type of seller because of the ratings bump um, that, that they experienced at CBS during the course of his games. So, uh, you know, once you do that, now you've raised that bar. Um, but, but like I said, I mean, you know, I'm going to be biased, but when you've got the guy that I consider to be the best in the league, if, if that's where that bar has now been set at, it's just a matter of time before somebody's going to come and get Troy Aikman and try and steal him from it. Okay. I want to ask you about uh, your former broadcast partner, Tony Siragusa. I know you're uh, deeply saddened uh, by uh, the death of uh, Tony uh, last month. Uh, you know, when I think about his broadcasting career, forget the football career, he became an iconic figure on the sideline during games that you called with him for over a decade. Yeah, it kind of revolutionized the position. You know, that was the, the, the sideline reporter was was always the person that would would bring you up to speed on issues that had happened during the course of the game, an injury report. You know, they, they've gotten more involved now where, where they're getting some insight and, and adding a little bit more than just, you know, some of the the injury data or status of the players. But Tony really took it to the point where, you know, he wanted to be, you know, the, the sideline analyst. And, and there was actually some things, you know, emotional, you know, transitions during the course of the game are tangible and, and you can really feel them. And, and we're away from that in the booth. And so that was one of the big conversations that Tony and I always had. You'd see a flip in the game and I'm like, the momentum just completely left that side, didn't he? he goes, oh, my God, you can feel it. You know, you can just look at that side and, and you can see, you know, kind of the uncertainty there and you can see the confidence growing on the other side. So it was great for me to be able to have somebody that, you know, had played the game uh, and, and was familiar with those transitions and emotion and how momentum swings back and forth. And you've got to grab it while you can during the course of the game and to be able to have those conversations with them. Um, you know, but the biggest thing about Tony and, you know, we, we saw this with with everybody who was at his services, you know, everything that he did, he made an impact in that industry. Um you know, when you, when you saw on social media, the, the, the people that, that reached out to him from, you know, Snoop Dogg to, you know, all the people in the NFL, all the people in the movie industry, all the people in the music industry, uh, it, it, it was amazing how many people he touched. And, and when he did, when he was a part of what you were doing, um, it, it was a unique thing. And I always tell people, listen, there's Tony Siragusa and then there's Goose. It's kind of like there's Deion Sanders and there's Primetime. Um, you know, primetime is who you see on TV. Deion Sanders is, is an awesome man. Uh, Tony Saragusa is that same thing. You know, there's Goose, you know, the big, you know, you know, bombastic guy on the sideline. And then there's Tony Saragusa, who is one of the greatest husbands, greatest fathers you're ever going to have an opportunity to learn from. Um, so that was, uh, that was a very, that was a very sad week. Um, and, you know, as, as would be with Tony Saragusa, we, we went up for the services the line had to be 
a quarter mile long outside the church for seven hours for people wow. to get in and say goodbye. It went out the door, down to the corner, and then all the way down to the next corner. And that we got there at three o'clock and it and had been started at one. And when we left at, at six o'clock, it was finally down to the first corner. But that's how many people came through to pay their respects. That's the impact that he had on people's lives. Um, just uh, just an amazing guy. You know, it's a, it, uh, the, great, the great thing about him was, you know, week to week with us, you know, it, you get into a rut. You get into a routine when you're doing these games uh, because it's like Groundhog Day. Um, and, and if you're not careful, you, you really, it, it can impact your, your, you know, how you're doing your broadcast because you're just into that routine and that rut. He was the biggest disruptor. Uh, any type of routine that I have ever been around. I mean, he was like a camp counselor on Saturdays. You know, if we were in New Orleans, you know, we we're going to go out and get on a on a, a, a swamp boat and go see alligators. You know, we we're going to, you know, if in Florida, you know, we're going to go out and we're going to go fishing. Um, you know, if we were somewhere that had something unique, he had always coordinated something for us to do to take advantage of what that city provided for us. So, um, you know, he just, he said, listen, we're not going to sit around in this hotel room all day Saturday and keep studying. You could do the game right now if you had to. So let's, let's clear our heads. Let's go out. Let's get away from football for a little bit and, and enjoy each other's company. So uh, just a very, just a very, very unique guy to work with. Uh, a guy you want in your locker room, right? Oh my God. Without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. He's, you know, he, he'll drive you crazy, but you, you want him on your sideline. You want him as, as your teammate. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Without a doubt. Okay, the USFL is a great developmental league for players and uh, it's, a, it's, it's going to stay around for, for hopefully many years. I know you're coming back and you're doing a, a year two, but the USFL is also a great developmental ground for coaches who want to become broadcasters. Case in point, Jason Garrett, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, NBC's got a, an opening because Drew Brees is not going to come back. And, uh, you know, it was something that Jason tinkered around with when his playing career ended before he got into coaching. So, uh, you know, it was good to see him there. 